Um, this will just go through the, the existing implementation, the proposed new implementation, um, and the differences between them, and then some additional tooling changes. So as implemented today, uh, the ACLs for a channel are specified uh, initially during channel creation. Um, they're specified in a field called isolated data, um, under which is a map under a key. Um, and then the ACLs are specified as key value pairs, um, in particular following a convention of sort of resource um, a function name and then a string pointing to a particular policy. Um, so here the example we give is qscc.getBlockByNumber maps to channel application readers. Um, now that's how these ACLs are initially specified and um, based on the, the feedback I've gotten from assorted users, that seems to be pretty much the extent of how people utilize the ACLs today. Um, it is possible to modify them. Um, you may do this through a peer resource update, which is very similar to a config update. You know, essentially, you pull the current resources config, you modify it, compute an update, you submit that update to ordering, and eventually it is evaluated at the peer. Um, like I said, I, I don't think anyone's actually been doing these peer resource update things, um, but that is the mechanism in place to update the ACLs today. So uh, the, the problems um, with why we don't just sort of commit what's there um, into the officially supported, um, or to be officially supported, um, is that this resources tree thing is um, a little heavyweight. You know, when, when we were originally designing things, we thought that this resources tree was going to handle all sorts of other tasks, like uh, the chain code lifecycle and, and so forth, um, but we didn't end up doing that. So uh, if you look in the peer code, you'll see that there's a, a custom commit hook and a bunch of logic around that for supporting resources trees. We have the additional um, transaction types defined in the protos. Um, and then we, we have to play some games at places in the peer code to make sure that the, um, the, the resources config and the channel config are synchronized, that you sort of, you end up wanting to use the most recent of both, um, in particular because the resources config can refer to policies in the channel config. Um, so it's, it's not the most trivial implementation. Um, the reason why we did it like this is because we thought with all these other operations being on board, like chain code lifecycle, that, that things would end up getting changed quite a bit. Uh, but since the scope has been narrowed um, and changes seem to be infrequent, um, some of these objections seem uh, less, less important today. So the uh, proposed finalization is uh, very similar to today's with, with a few notable, differ notable differences. Um, first, we'll, we'll continue to specify the initial ACL config um, at channel creation time, uh, but rather than in that isolated data section, it'll be in the, the normal config section. We'll continue to express the ACLs in terms of those same key value pairs, um, but rather than update through a peer resource update, we'll use a config update, uh, which is really still the same process. You pull the current config, modify it, compute the update, submit it, and uh, the only difference being that the orderer does validation against it instead of simply the peer. So I just enumerated them, but just to uh, be explicit about it, the config goes into the standard section, not isolated data, Updates switch from being a peer resource update to a config update, and now updates are also evaluated at the orderer, not just the peer. Uh, the other half to this story is that um, although functionally ACLs work in 1.1, uh, there was really no good way for users to specify them. Um, so users who wanted to specify ACLs had to basically decode their um, channel creation transaction, uh, go into the JSON form, add some fields, um, then re-encode it and submit it. 
uh, which is obviously not a very user-friendly way, and, and I think that's why we've only had a, a very select number of users who really wanted this feature um, who have been using it. Um, so we need to enable tooling to make this sort of a first-class documentable feature. And the natural place for this is config TX gen, um, because it's responsible for generating the uh, channel creation transactions. And uh, since config TX gen is configured through config TX YAML, um, what we can do is we can extend config TX YAML to include some additional information about policies and ACLs. So here's a, a proposed modification to the config TX YAML schema. Or schema. Um, there's an existing application section, um, which today only really defines your organizations for your, ch your channel. Um, but we can add two new sections under this. Uh, one can be a policy section, uh, which will allow users to define, um, you know, freeform policies for, uh, in addition to the defaults that we give, or to allow them to override those defaults. Um, here, we're using a relatively simple syntax: give the policy a name, um, and each policy, each named policy, has a type. Um, today, we only have two types of policies. Um, and then a rule. So for the signature policy type, we would use the same rule syntax um, that's enabled via the peer CLI for specifying things like endorsement policies. And for the implicit meta policy types, um, we would have to invent a new syntax, but um, as these policies are really relatively simple, um, I put here majority readers. I think that would be um, expressive enough, so the first word could be the, uh, the rule, namely any, majority, or all, and the second word would be the sub-policy, um, in this case, readers. Uh, finally, we could add an ACL section, which would uh, be that mapping we discussed earlier, the, the ACL name, um, such as qscc.getblockbynumber, and the corresponding uh, policy name. Uh, here, um, you can see an example of referencing one of the default policies, channel application readers, um, as well as referencing one of our new policies, uh, channel application bar. Um, and that's, uh, that's it. Um, my hope is that this design is, is fairly um, uncontentious, but I'd like to open the floor for anyone who has comments. Uh, this is just one clarification. So this, um, uh, in the foo example, you have and there. So in the context of ACL, does and have uh, any significance, or is it going to be single person uh, mostly there? Um, so ACLs are kind of a, a, a generic concept for almost all of the ACLs, such as get blocked by number. Um, you should not be having ands um, because there's only one signature you can evaluate. Um, but you can imagine that, uh, for instance, if we wanted to specify an endorsement policy, um, then, then and would be applicable. Um, but you know, really, my, my hope was that this policy section would not only be useful for ACLs, um, but could also be used to override default policies like channel application admins um, for users who uh, wanted more sophisticated policies um, in, in, in their deployments. Yeah, right. I just wanted to make sure that I'm not missing something uh, at the end, the kind of thing in the context of ACL. So in ACL, either it would be individual entries or it would be like kind of one entry separated by or. Correct. Okay, good. But in this example, you have readers, right? Uh, For the get config block, I said channel application bar. Um, which is majority readers, which would be a very bad policy. I, you could never satisfy that ACL. Okay. So that's, that's kind of my contrived example is a bad one here. So uh, remind me something again. You, you may have covered it, but I missed it. Um, in the original iteration, the rationale was that we didn't want the orderer to do this processing work. And in the proposed design, we are reversing that decision. 
Um, why is that? Uh, the simple answer is that um, no one seems interested in changing these ACLs frequently, um, that it seems largely like it will be static configuration. Um, so um, really, I think the additional load on the order will be pretty minimal. Um, and, you know, because we already use, you know, we, we instruct users that they should be um, inspecting the config block um, before joining a channel, for instance, um, I, I think the overall ap approach is a little cleaner having it all in one place rather than split into. A quick question, uh, Jason. So this, the the new rules, the majority readers that you have, is that is it going to be a different language for that? Or so these types of policies already exist, um, and and they're already in use in the channel configuration. Um, so it's it's really more of a new syntax. Um, up until now, all of these rules have been generated as defaults out of config TX gen. Um, We've never allowed a user to specify them directly unless they wanted to go edit protobufs or JSON. Um, so this is just uh, creating a new language for specifying these. Okay. Uh, Jason, this is Angelo. So I think you said that uh, the update, uh, it, it, it's exactly the same. What's the policy that, uh, j just to refresh my mind, so what's the policy that is used to, to allow an update of the, the configuration? And if you can specify, you can modify also the, or you can specify this policy inside this uh, config.tx.yml. Correct. So um, by default, the the mod policy of everything is is simply um, an unqualified admins. Um, so in this context, since we're in the channel application namespace, the modification policy for these would all be channel application admins by default. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, if you were interested in, in a more sophisticated configuration, um, you may set these mod policies to point to any policy you desire. Um, there's always sort of a balance to be struck in config TX YAML about making it expressive while making it understandable. Um, so I've elected, um, up to this point at least, not to allow users to specify mod policies um, that if they would like to change the default mod policy scheme, um, that they can go do that manually. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this is just one high level question. Go ahead. Yeah, so this uh, uh, APL thing, so conceptually, does it belong to uh, channel configuration? Because isn't it the case that um, uh, philosophically it is within organization because as an organization, they have all those APIs, they have all those data, and now they want to control that who within the organization want to, um, should be allowed to query for example, let's say we are the two orgs uh, dealing uh, with uh, with some business, and we have our own peers. Now, within my organization, should we allowed to uh, access, let's say, get block by number from my peer? Should you as an organization be bothered about that, or? Yeah, you know, I, I guess uh, I've not been. Uh, analyzing the the original requirement, um, I, I've been more focused on trying to translate the the original implementation and in, in, into something final. Um, my feeling, though, about that is that um, there will be APIs that need to be accessible um, across organizations, and um, you may also have organizations which. Um, you know, are not um, actively particip participating with peers, um, and for those sorts of rules, this this makes more sense.
So this ACL name, uh, are we going to document what can be specified there? Or? Um, I assume what we'll, we'll do is I'll, I'll probably add an ACL section, um, a, a sort of top-level ACL section, which enumerates all the ACLs and their defaults. Okay. Um, and then we'll just use a YAML reference to, to import them into the assorted configurations. Any other questions? Okay, if uh, no one else has any other question, we can just uh, wrap up the call. Uh, Jason, you want to, that's it? Um, yeah, um, so it, it sounds like uh, there, are, there are no objections. Great. Um, then uh, thank you all for your questions and for joining, and um, I will get to work on implementing this. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.